everybody and welcome back to Theology, where we drink tea and talk theology. Today we are drinking lychee tea, which is made from lychee blossom and flowers, uh, not from the fruit itself. And it's quite a light tea. It's black tea. It's quite floral. I got this tea uh, when I was visiting China, so I can't exactly like tell you the exact tea that I got. Um, but I can I'll leave a link to uh, lychee tea itself. So this tea we'll be drinking for the next few weeks because we are doing a series on covenant or covenants, covenants or covenants, however you say it, it doesn't really matter there, it isn't really consensus that I know of, either's right in my books, I'll probably use both. And we're starting that series so we'll be doing a bit of laying the groundwork over the next couple of weeks and then we'll be diving into some of the important covenants in the Bible, name, uh, particularly those between God and people. To first discuss covenants at all, we kind of need to understand what they are. This isn't as easy if I was to say a covenant or talk about a contract. You have a lot more understanding in our general vernacular of what we talk about, of what a contract is, than what a covenant is. So we're going to go through definitions, we're going to break it all down today. So in its most simple form, a covenant is an agreement, though it's slightly more than just like any old agreement. It's quite a formal and serious agreement. In a legal sense of the word, it is a formal written agreement between two or more parties like business, people or a state um, or countries. When we look at covenant from that perspective, it being these written formal agreements, uh, we kind of see that a lot more things could be called a covenant. A lot of things that have contracts could be called covenant because you have made an agreement or a promise to uphold something with them. We most commonly would associate covenant with a marriage and if you get legally married, there are there's contract you sign and you make a promise, you make a covenant with the person to uphold the contract. But there are some other things that are also technically could be called a covenant. Uh, so if you're buying land or a house, you might have a mortgage and so you might go into covenant with the bank or because you legally own it and you've got contract and all the land rights and everything, it might be considered a covenant with the state and the government. Uh, treaties like the uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi or Treaty of Waitangi um, or the Treaty of Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Those are technically also considered covenants. They're agreements often between states and parties. Leaders in public service make covenants when they are sworn in on like an oath of allegiance and loyalty typically. There are covenants all around us, or things we could technically call covenants, even if we don't really use that word. And we just don't always realise that that is an appropriate place to use the word covenant as well. I'm not saying we have to start walking around saying that, oh, everything's covenant in that way. But it gives us a better idea of what a covenant is. So covenants are formal agreements, and breaking a covenant tends to have very serious consequences attached to it for either party. This helps us have a framework for beginning to think about covenants. And the biggest thing regarding how covenants have changed over the ages is what they look like. While the idea and intention has remained the same, the uh, practicalities and what they look like will be different. So for us, uh, the written, signed part of the agreement is one of the more important parts of the agreement. It is what makes it legal is because it's written and it's signed and there's the paperwork behind it. For ancient civilizations and much older civilizations, that wasn't always the case. It's uh, caused huge problems when we're looking at land ownership historically and trying to return land to its rightful owners. That's just one thing, is that written ownership versus the... Uh, other other forms of agreement, whether that be particular oaths or practices that were undertaken to show that ownership was just as valid. And we know a lot about how these covenants looked in those times where the Bible was written 
from writings from the Near East in the Early Bronze Age about covenants and the particularities of them. So it was something that was taken note of and care of because it's something that could last a long time. It was really important. And these covenants, or at least the ones we're focusing on, will be covenants that are typically between two states um, or groups of people, not necessarily one person to one person. And they're the same idea as the treaty or the contract between these two states. And the two that I'll be talking about and focusing on are two of the most common ones, particularly most common ones that will come up in uh, reading the Torah and the Old Testament overall. So one is called a parity covenant and one is called a suzerainty covenant. A parity covenant. This is one that is set up between two equal parties. This could be between uh, kings, between neighbours, between nations, as long as they were considered equal. They were more similar to what our treaties would look like today. And they're made by one party proposing the covenant to the other and the other accepting that covenant. Like a marriage you propose and the person accepts, it would then be cemented through an oath or a meal shared. So again, like a marriage, the covenant's proposed and accepted. And then there is often an oath, which would be like the vows and saying I do and that stuff. And a meal shared, which often is the reception. It's a big party. Though that's a little bit, <laughs> it's a bit more interesting now with COVID and everything. But anyway, so a biblical example of a parity covenant is seen in 1 Kings 5. And this is in verse 12, where it says it specifically. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. This treaty is also considered a covenant. So in some translations, they will use the word covenant here. Chapter 5, which is about preparations for building the temple, talks about the covenant that was formed in that between Hiram and Solomon to help build the temple. This covenant was able to take place between Solomon and Hiram because Solomon and Hiram were seen as equals. They were both kings and they were able to uh, have equal weight in what they could offer in the covenant as well, even though those were different. So that is what makes it a parity covenant is that they are equals. Now, the next one, and I'm going to butcher this word so much, or often, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying my best. So, a suzerainty covenant. A suzerainty covenant has two parties, again, and the difference is that the parties aren't equal in standing. So, a suzerain is where one party has uh, some sort of control, military or otherwise, over another party that otherwise tends to govern itself. The party that the suzerain has control over is called a vassal. A vassal is someone who is in the covenant with the suzerain, but retains their own ability to govern themselves completely, but their military or resources, there is a shared thing where they give a certain amount to the suzerain. And the suzerain can offer protection or that type of stuff in return. If you've ever played Civilization, this uh, um, suzerain and vassal are a part of that, and the um, vassal is typically what the city states are, and you can be a suzerain to the city states in the game Civilization. So that's like the most uh, likely. Uh, example I can find but we don't really have them a lot nowadays in the same way or at least not that I know of. One of the defining features of this covenant is the imbalance of power. The suzerain has more power than the vassal. They might be a bigger nation or uh, be way wealthier that type of thing. The vassal retains the ability to make most of their own decisions. They are still their own person. They aren't enslaved and owned by the suzerain. They are still owned by themselves, basically. The suzerain, however, can make certain demands as well as offering certain necessities like or services or goods to the people. Part of this is that a suzerain 
is allowed to have multiple vassals. A vassal can only have one suzerain because of what this is all about. This is because the type of covenant is seen as off as a reward for loyalty. So if a smaller group shows loyalty to the suzerain, the suzerain can offer a suzerainty covenant with them. And that means that they are bound to that loyalty to the suzerain. So they'll get more rewards for that loyalty that they have shown, but it's also a um, promise of future loyalty from the vassal. So the suzerain, you can have multiple people be loyal to you. It's hard for you to be loyal to multiple people. And so the vassal, because it's all based on loyalty on the vassal's part, it is about the vassal's loyalty to the suzerain, not the suzerain's loyalty to the vassal. And that promise of future loyalty is very important because if they are loyal to something else, they are breaking that covenant. And so there are significant consequences for that breaking of the covenant because they've broken that loyalty. This is the kind of covenant that has to be made between God and people because the imbalance of power there is so great. We can never ever be equal to God, never in any lifetime of any number of generations or descendants, we can never be equal to God. And so any covenant made there has the greatest imbalance of power ever possible. When we are making a suzerainty covenant, we will always be the vassal when we're doing it with God. Um, I like how vassal sounds a lot like vessel in this context because it's like a little pun. There are also four very important things to do with a suzer suzerainty covenant as well. So one, it is initiated by the suzerain who swears an oath binding himself to some obligation on behalf of the vassal. The suzerain swears only blessings but is able to curse the vassal's enemies. The suzerain is bound unconditionally to fulfill his grant or the obligation that he has said he will perform. It extends to the vassals future generations as well. So this is a generational covenant that is made for the vassal. I think it only stops when the suzerain dies or when like something else happens. But there are consequences for breaking the loyalty that was promised. And so those are four things that I will talk through when we're talking through the covenants being made with God and some of the people in the Bible, how it fulfills those criteria and what those criteria are as well. Because if it's going to be a suzerainty covenant, then it is going to be one that will meet those requirements in some way or another. So yeah, so we'll be talking a little bit more about covenants over the next couple of weeks. I'm not exactly sure when we'll get into the ones between people, but we will. Also, the next month of my life is very busy, so it's going to be, uh, as you might have noticed already, I don't know, um, but uploads might be a little bit more chaotic at when they appear, and I hope that's all good, and you're going to have to deal with it either way. I will see you all next week, probably, and I hope you enjoy. I'm excited to start this uh, Covenant series with you all. Bye.